I uh, am here representing the Orange County Audubon Society, uh, which uh, dedicates its time uh, to uh, preserving land as far as habitat for you know our wonderful wildlife. And so the colors which we'll see here, you could go to an Audubon sanctuary and hopefully see some of those. But then also offering programs uh, to the public, educational uh, hikes, bird outings to get uh, people, uh, you know, just starting to experience just the beauty of, of nature uh, around them. Uh, so here's some contact information uh, about Audubon. Um, if you're interested, then ah, feel free to, to join or to, you know, reach out and ask any questions um, uh, that you have. Um, just a little bit about uh, me. I'm a professor of biology at Orange County Community College, and I teach a number of courses in biology. Um, during my talk, uh, when I teach, I just like to have video in the background because just I would prefer that, you know, if you have to listen to me, you have to. But instead of looking at me, you're looking at the birds or the fish or the algae. I mean, that's I mean, I love this stuff. And I'll bet you a lot of you are here because you love it, too. So, you know, the, there'll be videos in the background. If um, you or see any of this and you say, oh, I might like to see that again, or, or you know, he cut it short. I'd like to see, you know, the fuller version. Um, just, you know, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, so if you were to type in Dr. Jan 41, D-R-J-A-H-N 41, and then space YouTube, you would go to here. All right, it turns out there's 40 other Dr. Jans, who knew? Um, and then I have videos. I organize them into topics like anatomy for my classes. Um, but I do have a section uh, which is uh, wildlife. And so there's stuff about birds and salamanders and fish, you know, playlists of videos here. So if you see something that you uh, are interested in, uh, then uh, uh, these are here. The playlist here uh, that you're going to be seeing tonight, if you want to playlist, it would probably be the first uh, one uh, that would pop up uh, for you um, there. And we can close. Unfortunately, we were tr playing with the volume. I even have a number of songs, and there are two relevant to tonight's presentation. We were having trouble with the, you know, the volume coming through on your end. But if you see them and you say, oh, I'd like love to hear those songs, uh, they would be at the bottom here. Um, were there any issues or, or questions before I begin? We're good to go, it looks like. Okay. Well, once again, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, color. I'd like to I'd say, so there's a lot of different ways in which we could address color and talk about it. And personally, I'd like to try to do a little bit of all of it. So, you know, why there is color, how we see color, uh, and then talk about, you know, color from, you know, algae to fish to birds uh, to mammals uh, to even ourselves potentially. Uh, so a little bit of everything. Um, so there's all of this energy around us, you know, and there's light, there's ultraviolet, uh, visible light, ultraviolet but light. And molecules are funny in that their electrons are in specific positions and they can move. So if the right amount of energy hits them, these electrons can jump into another excited uh, state. Um, but because of the structure of the atom, each or, or molecule, each molecule can only absorb certain packets. So if you happen to be wearing a blue shirt, this is what's going on with you. That sunlight hits the blue shirt and the red light gets absorbed. The green light gets absorbed, but the blue light doesn't. It bounces off. It is reflected. And so when you look at someone wearing a blue shirt, blue light hits your eye and you say, oh, that person is wearing a blue shirt. So all of the colors of white light hit the shirt, but it's reflecting blue. That's why it looks uh, blue to you. And then as you might guess, you know, green light, you know, et cetera, uh, a, a green shirt would do something similar, but now be reflecting uh, green light. So we have a variety of pigments which can absorb specific uh, wavelengths of light and reflect others based on the molecular uh, structure. Um, so, uh, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, the wavelengths of visible light. Uh, one of the things I'd like to just um, add is there's also ultraviolet light, uh, which uh, comes up with fish, with birds, and then with the threat of skin cancer in humans. So um, in addition to visible light, there's other kinds uh, which uh, uh, in, uh, interest us. Okay. Well, talking about color in the world, let's start small and start off with the cyanobacteria, which some of us call blue-green algae, uh, but are actually a form of bacteria. Now, just let me be blunt. 
These are perhaps one of Earth's most underrated organisms because for half of Earth's history, there's no oxygen appreciably in the air. And then these cyanobacteria appear. And then in the second half of Earth's history, there's oxygen in the air because they do photosynthesis using their green pigment chlorophyll. All right, so this pigment absorbs lots of light, but reflects green, so it looks green to you. And because of the light that they absorb from the sun, um, they can turn carbon dioxide and water into sugar, all right, which not only benefits them, but then anything that eats uh, them, all right? So uh, that is why they are green. If you're thinking that you're not all that impressed, because don't say plant cells, aren't they green? Don't they do photosynthesis? Don't they release um, oxygen into the air? Yes, they do, because what we call the chloroplast inside a plant cell is actually the remains of these blue-green algae. So once again, blue-green algae, crazy important. So they are green. Green algae are green because once again, they have cyanobacteria as chloroplasts living inside their cells. Now, when I think about color, I think um, the way that light is absorbed and reflected, we could break it into two big categories. One, you're absorbing light because, or reflecting it because you want to, it's something about you versus two, and most of the presentation will be out, um, you're concerned about how others see you. Maybe this is a predator, maybe this is members of your group or a potential mate. So sometimes when I'm talking about light, it's absorbing light um, for say photosynthesis, as opposed to reflecting it, you know, so that other members see you with stripes on you or whatever. Let's take the first one first. These algae are green because they want to absorb sunlight and the molecule that they're doing it with chlorophyll just happens to be reflecting green light and absorbing the other uh, wavelengths and the energy they absorb from um, the energy they absorb from the sun is what they're using to make uh, sugar. So there are green algae. There's also other kinds of algae as well. There's red algae, there's brown algae. Um, diatoms, we could actually call golden brown algae if we wanted to. So uh, there's different kinds of algae and uh, some of them have different pigments. So, and this will get, uh, become important when we start talking about fish. Uh, so, you know, what colors do we see? Uh, different photosynthetic organisms are using different, um, uh, uh, different pigments to absorb sunlight for photosynthesis. So some are green, but then you can get other colors. There are red algae, uh, there is uh, brown algae as well, all right? So that affects algae, but it also affects some animals, all right? So uh, in the not too distant future, all right, we're going to have a warm, rainy spring night and all of the spotted salamanders, all of the wood frogs are going to go to a, a pool and lay their eggs. And if you were to come back a little bit later and look at wood frog eggs, same with spotted salamanders, this video is wood frogs, look at their color. They're green. Why? Because algae are living inside the wood frog eggs. And it's a beneficial relationship because the algae are producing oxygen as a waste that the little baby frog embryos are using to breathe. The frog embryos are producing carbon dioxide that the algae want. Uh, the uh, frog embryos are producing urea that the algae want. And so here's an example where the algae, which are um, pigmented for photosynthesis, are actually now adding colors to animals. Now, that's a local example. Um, but one of the, I mean, the most beautiful examples is if we go to here, like if you look at a coral reef, you just look at the colors. There are so many colors in a coral reef, which is odd because, well, I mean, first of all, what are corals doing? They're animals. Corals are animals, but here they are just sitting there making a life for themselves. How do they do that? Well, it's because even though corals are animals, they have algae living inside them, a type of algae known as a dinoflagellate. And these algae have pigments. So the animals have pigments because inside their cells are algae which have pigments. So corals are animals that do photosynthesis because of the algae living inside them. And I'll be, I'll be getting back to fish in just a, a little bit. 
But here at a coral reef, there are so many beautiful bright colors because once again, there are algae which uh, are trying to absorb certain wavelengths of uh, light and have pigments which do that. Now, why isn't everything green? Well, for lots of reasons, but one of them is as you go deeper in the water column, the wavelengths of light which are available change. So blue, purple, and green wavelengths, uh, those uh, types of light have more energy, so they're going deeper in the water. Whereas the reds and the yellows, they don't have as much energy, so they don't go very deep. So if you're trying to absorb light for photosynthesis, um, how deep you live depends on which wavelengths are available, which are available to you, which depends like determines which color you want to be. Now, those colors are beautiful, beautiful. I love seeing them, but I also love seeing them because when you see colorful coral, that means it's healthy. And this would be a whole nother talk. And I'm sorry, if this bothers anybody, the light that I'm in or the room that I'm in, um, the camera, doesn't think I'm here anymore because it can't see me. Uh, so it's now dark behind me. If When I start holding up birds, if you can't see the birds, I'll run over here and turn on the light again. Um, but here, this is a beautiful, healthy coral. Now, it's not the topic of today's you know, conversation, but when coral loses its color, we call it bleaching. And if you look here, this bleached coral just doesn't have the fish diversity that the healthy coral had. This coral is dying. All right. So um, sometimes a color is about absorbing um, absorbing uh, light. Uh, and I'll talk about black and white coloration in just a second. But before I do that, let's just start throwing in how we perceive light. OK, um, just as I said, a light can bind to certain molecules and change them in your eyes. You've got this molecule. All right, uh, uh, retinol, which binds uh, to uh, opsin. And the thing that's special about it is if light hits this molecule, it'll shift. It'll go from this shape to that shape. So you start off with this shape, light hits it, and it goes there. And that's how you can tell your brain, I've just seen light. Because uh, when the molecule has one shape, you register that it, I haven't seen light. And when it changes its shape, you register that it it does. So you have these opsin proteins, which will absorb certain types of light. And then you can tell your brain, hey, I've seen light. Now, let's talk about us higher primates. And, and just believe it or not, this is not only important for primates, but this becomes very relevant with birds and fish as well in a second. Um, regular mammals aren't all that good with color. That's because most mammals are actually nocturnal. I mean, 40% of mammals are rodents. And so most mammals have two genes to see color, one for blue and one for both red and green. So red and green are perceived by the same um, protein. And that protein in the eye is encoded by a specific chromosome. On, in humans, that's the X chromosome at one of the ends. So most mammals have a blue and then one here that does red and uh, green. And you know what this does. A hunter can go out in the woods wearing orange. Doesn't, you know, doesn't the deer see the orange? And the answer is no, it doesn't. The deer perceives orange as green because this is the protein that this gene makes perceives both red and green equally. So the deer sees orange and green and thinks it's the same color. Now, we primates, we kind of laugh at that. We say, ha, you, know, you dichromatic mammals that only see in colors. We are trichromatic, we see three, because once upon a time there was an accident, a genetic accident where when uh, cell division was occurring, one gene got duplicated. So that instead of having one gene here, there are now two. All right, two genes. And then over time, they changed a little bit. So one got better at perceiving red and one got better at perceiving green. And so now we higher primates and we humans, we distinguish between red and green as different colors, something that the deer does not. So obviously for a primate, if you live in a tree, it's good to know the difference between the green leaves and the red berries because you might eat the red berries. Whereas a deer or a dog or a bull would see um, these as all of the same color. So a gene duplication 
changed our vision, all right, from dichromatic to trichromatic. Interestingly, we're not done. Some humans have even more genes. So some people have four genes for red because there have been more duplications or as many as seven for green. And if they're not all identical, that means that some people are better at seeing colors than others. So you might be really good at interior design. You can tell which colors match and you look at someone else and they just don't have that skill. One of the reasons is that other person may just have one red and one green where you have multiples. All right. Now I say this because, in part because um, I'm talking about how we perceive color. But I also want to stress, and I'm going to say something, please, I don't want to offend anyone. I don't hope you take this, I don't want you to take this too personally. But when we talk about like fish or birds, um, the reality is it's not always about you. So, I, you know, please don't don't take that the wrong way. I see a chat. Is someone offended? Okay. No, no. They're asking, oh, okay. when did this gene duplication occur? Is there any sense of uh, where in yes. the evolutionary tree? Yes, there is. Exactly. Um, so uh, the first primates include some which are nocturnal and they just have one gene. Then the next branch led to the New World monkeys that you find in, say, South America. Now, the, the duplication didn't happen yet, although interestingly, if you're a female South American monkey, you might be able to see uh, red and green, and I'd be happy to explain you know, why later. But this occurred at, in the first members of what are called the Caterine primates. So if you look here, just my video, uh, the uh, the lemur and all of these would be primates. Uh, the new world monkey and these guys in yellow would be anthropoid primates. But the old world monkeys that are in like in Africa, Asia, and there's one at the tip of Spain, they're old world monkeys. And then the apes, the ancestor of those, that's the one that had this duplication. So yes, it would have been, um, ah, darn, I should know this. I, I think this would be like 35 million years ago, um, because I think the apes uh, start at 20. Uh, but it would be the ancestor of old world monkeys, apes, and humans uh, where this occurred. Good question. Getting back to uh, this. So what you see is different from a deer. So a deer can't see the difference between orange and green. So when we talk about color, we start to realize, ooh, it's relative. My perception of color is different from the deer's perception of color. Guess what? Birds see an ultraviolet. We have three primary colors. Birds have four. I look at a black bird and I say, oh, no offense, black bird, but eh, that's not as interesting as the multicolored one that has the purple and the violet, you know, and the blue and the shiny this. But the way that the bird sees the black bird, it sees all these bright colors. So if we're asking why does a bird have a specific coloration, it's not about us. The bird didn't, you know, pigment itself for our benefit. It's often trying to influence other birds. So it then becomes relevant, how do birds see this bird's color? How do fish see this other fish's color? And, and I'll get into that, that, and that varies a little bit. So when we look at, you know, we try to explain why is a bird this color, Remember, it's not always about us. That bird doesn't look like that in the eyes of other birds all the time. So that, that's a little difficult, just you know, nice to keep in mind. Anyway, let's jump ahead a little bit into um, black and white um, uh, pigments. And let's first talk about, um, and uh, first uh, let's talk about uh, white. Um, so there are lots of reasons to have uh, color, as we will see, like courtship, and we get into it. But one of the reasons about black and white is sometimes it's about thermoregulation, because white pigments will reflect more light, while black pigments will absorb more light. And so sometimes it's about, I want to be cool in summer, or I want to warm up, and therefore I want to absorb more um uh, more wavelengths uh, of uh, light and be warm if I have a black pigment or I want to be cool. So sometimes that's the reason for color, right? So potentially white birds are cooler than black birds. I have read in, a, in scientific studies that there is a correlation that birds that migrate farther um, are more frequently white. So if you ask who's white and with which frequency, the birds that don't migrate at all they're more likely to be dark. 
all right, than the birds that migrate a little bit. The mi birds that migrate a little bit will, are more likely to be dark than the ones that migrate a lot, potentially because if you're doing all of this energy exertion, flying this long distance, then if the sun is beating down on you, you could overheat. And so it's a benefit for you uh, to be light and cooler, all right? And so uh, this can have a thermoregulation um, a feature to it. Here we see snow geese uh, migrating, and uh, it could uh, involve uh, migration as well. Now, in a lot of these, you'll see that uh, wings are black. The body is it's not always true. So here's South American flycatcher. Notice the body is black, the extremities are white. Um, so that's odd, that's unusual. Um, but I'll talk about why, for example, in snow geese and many other birds, the wingtips might be black in a second. All right. So sometimes it's about reflecting light. It's not about courtship or anything. And we even see that with some of the light colored trees. Why does this aspen have light colored bark? Why does the gray birch have white colored bark? Well, it's reflecting light. See, these trees have very thin bark and they grow in the open. And in winter, all right, you have this contrast between being super cold, but if you're in the sun, you could actually warm up pretty quickly, but then cool down at night very suddenly. And if your bark is thin and doesn't have all of these pockets for air, that's insulation, then that could actually damage the delicate living inner bark of the tree. So there are a lot of trees which have white bark for that reason, just like a white bird might want to reflect the light, um, these white trees might want to uh, do this. Of course, there are other reasons for white. Um, here we see an, uh, a snow goose, and if it's going to live in the Arctic, then obviously that's a reason for being white. Here you see a snowy owl, the same reason. If it was colored anything else, then its prey would uh, see it from a farther distance and it would have less to eat. So I'm not saying there's just one reason to be uh, white. There are certainly others, you know, as well. Um, same thing with a polar bear. So you'd think, why wouldn't the polar bear be black? Because it's freezing in the Arctic. Why wouldn't it want to absorb heat? Well, because it wouldn't get anything to eat because things could see it from far away. Also, um, the time of the year in Arctic where it's coldest, that's winter. And in the Arctic, there's sun at all. All right, so it wouldn't matter. Like you could be black and absorb sunlight, but in the Arctic winter, there isn't any sunlight. They have months of darkness. And, and so um, that's one of the reasons for being, there's multiple reasons to be white. Let's talk about the multiple reasons to be black. And I want to introduce a vertebrate cell type uh, called a melanocyte. So later, if we want to talk about humans, and it's a cell that only vertebrates have. And if we want to talk about human, uh, melanin is the primary color, uh, the pigment for our hair, our skin, and our eyes. All right, so if we want to talk about humans, and we can't at the very end, um, melanin becomes an issue. But here, let's look at a primitive fish, an early vert, like a branch of the early vertebrates. Look at its skin, look at all these melanocytes. These are these cells which are spindly, and then they can inject other cells with melanin. So fish have them, frogs have them. Um, reptiles have them, birds have them, mammals have them. So in general, um, brown, black, and, and even gray is determined by melanin. Melanin is, you know, a major pigment in vertebrates and the major pigment in uh, mammals. So look at this lamprey skin. Look at all of the melanocytes. And what they're doing is they're making pigments that they then inject into skin cells. So they set out these little spider processes and put um, and put a pigment uh, in them, all right? And so I'll go through this with each group, but it will repeat itself. When we look at black, that can be a lot of melanin. Brown, um, you can have different shades of melanin and even grays. Melanin is just a, a major color. Uh, once again, sometimes we do that to affect how others see us, um, but uh, I'll talk about black can absorb you know, heat. Also, it absorbs ultraviolet light. And we know because we put on sunscreen, we're worried about ultraviolet light hitting our skin. The more melanin you have in your skin, melanin will absorb ultraviolet light before it hits your DNA and causes a mutation. All right. So those who don't make melanin in the, their skin are at the highest risk for skin cancer. So once again, it's not always about, hey, I want other people or other individuals to see me as the color. Sometimes just what I'm absorbing or reflecting as a value. 
but then getting into black, like I said, there's a thermoregulation thing. If you care about heat, then black pigments will absorb more heat than um, uh, more of the sun energy because it will absorb all wavelengths and that could help warm up faster. So there's certainly a lot of black you know, animals and a lot of black birds. Once again, a caution, I just, it's so weird. And I have recently tried to purchase uh, filters for ultraviolet light and I have to do some photography and teach myself, but I'm sorry, it's not a skill that I have. Um, if you go online, you can, can look up pictures of this. There's a lot of images where I'll say, here's a black bird, but here's a bird, see it? And the bird looks purple. It has all these designs on it. So that bird looks black to me. That doesn't necessarily mean it means it's black to another bird. Um, but black pigment will heat up faster. And here are two black birds, and look what they're doing. Birds don't do this. At least I've never seen a white bird do this. They're holding out the wings to bask in the sun and warm up faster. Right. And so here, this cormorant and this turkey vulture, uh, you know, being warm is important to them and stretching a black. You know, wings, um, they will do that. Um, now, I have heard, I, I've heard two reasons why um, birds and wings, and especially wing tips, can be black. Because there are a lot of birds where you look at them, you know, they just have a little bit of black right at the tips of their wing. All right. Um, one that is protective, right? So there's that. And the other one, if black is absorbing, more sunlight's energy and get warmer. And just if you consider aerodynamics of flying, if the very tips of your wings are warmer, it's going to affect how air flows over and lifts up the, uh, the wings. And so flight becomes more efficient when your wingtips are black, just because now the surface of your wing has slightly different temperatures and that's going to affect the uh, wind goes over it. So once again, it doesn't have to be about courtship or hiding predators. It could be now, if I warm the very tips of my wings, this just means I use a little bit less energy when I fly, all right? Um, but I have read that uh, a white dog is less likely to overheat in a summer day when there's light on it than a black dog. So if you have a black dog, you have to be extra careful. Uh, and so obviously this black snake would benefit from this as well. One of the things that I mean I both enjoy about nature and which frustrates me a great deal is it's always much more complicated than the first statements. So Will black absorb more heat and you know more sunlight and, and you warm up faster? Yes, but there's more to it. So this raven, this picture I, I took was in the desert. All right. Why is the bird black if it wants to live in the desert? And the answer is its black feathers are actually helping to keep it cool. And once again, I'm sorry if this is confusing, but that's the thing that frustrates biology. Like nature should be simple. That would be great to tell simple stories. Very often it's not. It's not just the pig, it's how dense the feathers are and how they are structured. So in crows and ravens, they actually have like some lighter whitish like feathers, downy feathers underneath. So the black feathers are on the exterior. So the very outside of them heats up fast. But if it's the outside of you that is getting hot, all right, well, that affects how easy it is for wind to move uh, over uh, over you. And also how heat, once you get this, here's hot outer things, uh, outer layers, which wind is now taking away, it's now easier for the heat from the inside of the body to now escape and follow it. A white bird um, will reflect more sun, but they absorb a little. The little that they absorb is actually going to be now close to their skin, making it harder for the heat in their body to escape here. So once again, just if you were to get you know really deep into it and like the physics and the you know, whatever, they're often just things are a little more complicated. So a lot of the birds that live in deserts are black. It's not just about the pigment, but also the structure of the feathers, um, where, you know, uh, the density of the feathers as well, because then there's actually ways you could structure this that black would help keep cool. Once again, just a frustrating thing that, you know, sometimes nature is complicated. But now there's more pigments. 
Um, in those algae and then in the plants, there's all of these other pigments that they can use. So it's not just the green pigment, which is absorbing light. They have now reds and yellows and oranges, et cetera. And one group called the anthocyanins. They're made primarily by plants, all right? They can be found in all plant tissues. There's almost a thousand different kinds. And in autumn, uh, here we have, um, uh, you know, just all of the different shades that can be made. Sometimes uh, the pigment, whether it's more of a purplish or more of a red, is changed by pH. So if you change the acidity, that will change the color. So why are there different colors here? All right. Um, why would these plants make these uh, uh, these colors? Well, yeah. Here's I and once again, I don't want to offend anyone, especially if there's young people. Oh, here. Here's a tree. Okay. It has babies. All right. It, it's a good parent. Like it wants its babies to be successful, but not here. All right. Go away, children. Go out and be successful there. Because if you're successful here, then you're going to be taking sunlight and water and nutrients that the parent wants. The parent wants to be successful. Not here though, go away, you know, go be successful out there. And so when we look at then why uh, plants might be making some of these more colorful pictures is they want animals to eat their children because the seeds are coated with, um, you know, thick walls, which will allow most of them to pass through the vertebrate digestive system. So if this bird eats brightly colored um, berries, it does, the bird will fly away and then excrete, um, and I'll put the chat in just a second, excrete the seeds far away um, and even in a pile of feces, which is nutrients. So now the parent is happy, its child can be successful elsewhere where it's not going to compete uh, with the parent for water, et cetera. And so um, one of the reasons that these plants are making these other pigments is to attract animals uh, for seed dispersal. Plants can't move, so they'll bribe the animals to do it for them. Why do you suppose lighter skin humans? Ooh, all right. So that uh, is a great question. I was thinking of ending with the genetics because I teach genetics um, and I didn't know I didn't know whether this was going to be a bird group that to talk about birds of the exclusion of human genetics or vice versa. I was going to bring that up later. Let me um, let me answer quickly with the idea that there's much more genetics later. Uh, as far as we can tell, uh, in addition to just first of all, things vary. I mean, when you look at dog breeds, you know, some dog breeds have this form or shape or color. Other dog breeds, so just variation in itself doesn't necessarily need to have this is the reason for it so just you know humans and anything else just like i have here uh i have a red shafted flicker and a yellow shafted flicker that'll hold up their tail feathers are different is one better than the other no just varying in the population so there's that like so like is red hair better than brown hair or black hair no it can just be a variant i think a big answer to your question is um if you are in a warmer climate, uh, darker skin would absorb more heat, but you're exposed to more ultraviolet light, which would cause skin cancer, and now you have protection against that. So uh, uh, more melanin protects you from the sun. But then as you go farther north, there's a problem because skin produces vitamin D when sunlight hits it. But as you go farther north, less sunlight, less vitamin D, and vitamin D is important. So we think that as we look throughout the world, the two main pieces of the puzzle as whether our ancestors were, hey, you know, is there more of an advantage of having darker skin or lighter skin? Um, darker skin protects you from skin cancer, all right? while lighter skin would be uh, have the advantage in an area with less sunlight of allowing you to make more vitamin D, which is important for the immune system and other things. So that, you know, once again, variation, I'm sure has other pieces in it. Those seem to be the two big things that one is not definitely, you know, an advantage over the other, but that's a balance that depending on where uh, you were going, uh, where you live, that seemed to be an issue. So we have, uh, 
these anthocyanins. And there's another group, which I'll mention a lot, called carotenoids. All right. So carotenoids are modified from fatty acids. And, I'm, you know, we see the fruits and vegetables, but we see them in, um, in leaves uh, as uh, well. So uh, these are often giving us uh, the yellows, oranges, and reds. There's a whole lot of different kinds. And I'm going to skip you know, that, that aspect up. But once again, you can go and watch these videos more. Um, the anthocyanins are made in fall by addition, while the carotenoids are made by subtraction. Let me just explain what that means. So there comes a point in a fall leaf where it says, uh, we're preparing to draw our leaves. So the petiole, the part that attaches the leaf to the twig, starts to break down. At that point, nothing leaves the leaf. You've, you've broken the connection between the leaf and the stem. Nothing is going to leave the leaf. So now, if you do any more photosynthesis and you and with that energy you make a pigment, you are now becoming redder after you've made the connection. You are now adding more pigment. So when we look at uh, a lot of uh, the reds, especially you know in, uh, in oaks, red maples, this is by addition. As the leaf is preparing to drop, it is still making pigment, making it redder. Why would it do that? Well, if the leaf is going to drop, it doesn't matter, I guess, at the point. But what a lot of people think is that this is almost a warning time to insects. In autumn, a lot of the insects are saying, all right, we've made it the last time. We're about to lay eggs where we want our eggs to hatch in the next uh, spring. And by doing this, the tree is kind of saying, look how healthy I am. Look at all of my pigment. That if a bug was flying around, it might say, I'm not going to pick the healthiest tree to lay my eggs on. I'm going to pick an, an unhealthy one. So one of the reasons for bright colors in autumn might be plants trying to protect themselves from insects laying their eggs around that time. In contrast, the carotenoids, they're always in the leaves. But, all right, so I'm sorry, just back up like 10 seconds. So chlorophyll usually just drowns them out. All right, so there are already yellow pigments there, but you just can't see them. But as the leaf is preparing to drop, it then is going to suck the uh, green out, and now you see the yellow which is left. So the carotenoid is there by subtraction. All right. uh, so one of the reasons for carotenoids then is uh, just absorb different wavelengths of light that chlorophyll can't. Obviously, there are flowers that are all different colors. But what's going on here? And, and the answer is, like, like, here we have two blue flag irises in a swamp. And this one's attracted to that one. They would love to have sex. You know, we have Valentine's Day coming up soon. I mean, the flowers understand that. This flower would love to have sex with that one, but they can't move. They're stuck with their roots. So how can they mate if they can't move towards their you know, potential partner? And the answer is they now bribe uh, animals to come in and help, as I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar. A, B, I'll give you some free food. If you come in to this part of the flower, and unbeknownst to the B, that the male parts of the flower are going to rub pollen all over the B. And pollen is, in essence, sperm surrounded by a nitrogenous coat. Either sperm or the cells that, when they divide, become plant sperm. So the B will leave the flower covered in plant sperm, all right, pollen. And then when it goes for its next free meal here, all right, it's going to drop off some of the pollen um, uh, there. And hopefully now some of the sperm from flower number one fertilize the eggs in uh, flower number two. These two flowers had sex, even though neither of them can move. So it's a neat trick. And they did it because they attracted the bee. Now they could do it with scent, you know, but they're probably going to do it visually. And now it matters what colors does the bee see. Bees love blue and bees see ultraviolet. Like, so you look at a buttercup and say, oh, that's a nice yellow flower. It's more than a yellow flower. It's got blue lines on it, but you can't see that. It's an ultraviolet. Um, a bird could see it and a bee could see it. So another reason then for color is you're trying to attract an animal and a specific animal very often because it doesn't help the iris if B gets iris pollen all over it and then goes to this flower or this flower. It's taking the iris pollen and dropping it off in the wrong flower. The iris is having sex with its partner. 
So plants want animal pollinators to be faithful. And so we see what are called pollination syndromes, where you see a blue flower or and, and yellows are this way too. They're probably shooting for a bee pollinator. These don't see red, they see it as black. And so if you see a red flower, that flower is probably saying, I'm going to try to attract um, hummingbirds and butterflies. If you see a pale white flower, especially if it opens at night, it's attracting a moth. If you see one that's like, if you look at this, I'm sorry, so I'm going through all of these. If you look at that, you're like, ew, that's disgusting. All right, like what a flower would look like that. Once again, it's not about you. It's trying to attract a fly. It's trying to look like rotting flesh so that a fly will come to this one and then to another one just like it. So a lot of the colors that we see in plants are plants not only trying to attract animal pollinator, but specific ones. I'm trying to attract a bee. I'm trying to attract a butterfly. I'm trying to attract uh, a hummingbird. Yeah, so, so I've got the hummingbird. Yeah, so here's a hummingbird. This is a cardinal flower. All right, bees aren't going to visit red flowers all that often, and especially tubular shaped ones. You know, that flower thing, I want to be pollinated by an animal, specifically a hummingbird. So there's all these pigments out there, including these carotenoids. But now the interesting thing is we eat plants, we eat carrot, where carotenoid comes from, we eat blueberries, et cetera. All right, so you're eating these pigments. What do you do with them? Well, this could it actually affect the hue of human skin if you eat like a lot? Like you just like ate lots and lots of carrots. Like you might notice an oranging of your skin. Um, but let's go to plants and birds. If you're eating pigment from plants or algae, or I meant fish and birds. Um, if you're eating them, maybe you take this pigment from your digestive system and put it in your skin, making you red. So if you ask, where did the red pigment of the bird come from, from what it ate? Well, animals do this a lot. Look at, look at this developing egg yolk, all right? Why is it so yellow? Why is this fat tissue yellow? Because the yellow carotenoid pigment in the animal diet is then added to these tissues. So if we're eating pigmented molecules, sometimes we just take what we ate and put it into some of our tissues, all right? So. Animals do that. You know, look, there's color eggs. There's there's color here, et cetera. And as we'll see, uh, this adds a lot of the color to birds. All right, so yellows, oranges, reds, do birds make those colors? No, they eat those colors and then incorporate them into the feathers as they're forming to have the right colors. I'll get back to that. But here's an interesting thing. If you're a male scarlet tanager, all nice and red, or a male... Um, uh, Baltimore Oriole and or Orange, guess what females are doing? They're not only looking at your color to see what species you are, they want to see how healthy you are. If this is coming from what you've eaten, they can see how well you're eating. A bird that's not eating all that well isn't going to have this bright coloration. So not only, you know, we'll talk about courtship and, and species identification in a second, but the, the females are actually getting a measure of male health by the brightness of their colors. That's another reason for um, colors. Okay, I will get birds. Let me just, you know, I mentioned fish first. Uh, we'll kind of work ourselves up the, you know, the vertebrae chain. If you were to go scuba diving, I mean, the thing that's wonderful about the cribbing is all of the bright colors. All right, why? Well, there's, a, you know, it's a long answer and I'll do the very quick version of this. Um, there are a lot of reasons. So it's not one answer here. Uh, first of all, fish make lots of pigments. They make melanin, as I said. They eat algae, which has carotenoids. So now fish can make yellows and reds and oranges just like birds can. And then also, I'm gonna say this twice and it's going to, um, it's for birds and for fish. Why are there blue fish? Why are there green fish? Why are there shiny iridescent fish? Or, in a second I'll ask this, why are there blue birds? Why are there green birds? Why are there shiny iridescent birds? Uh, and no, I'm sorry, violet as well. Why are there violet? Most of the violet, there's other violet, most of the violet. The answer is it's not because of a pigment, right? There's no, like, if you take a blue shirt, you could take out of it blue dye and then make something else. There's blue dye in the shirt. You could extract it. 
in a red feather, there's red carotenoid pigment that you could take out and, and stain something else red. Not in blue fish and not in blue feathers, not in green fish and not in green feathers, not in shiny irritants and stuff. Why? Because it's the structure of the fish scale or the structure of the feather, which is going to diffract light in a certain way. All right. So there's no pigment molecule which you could say, oh, here's a blue pigment, you put it into something else. It's just the way that this feather of the scale is, uh, is layered and has a different structure, that certain things are bouncing off it in a certain way that give those colors. All right. So that's another reason for color. And I'll, I'll mention that again with uh, feathers in just uh, a little bit. All right. So um, fish have all of the potential colors. Um, them as some of them uh, come from the structure of the scale, how it reflects and reflects light. Why are these Caribbean fish so much more brightly colored than uh, we are? Well, one is, I mean, look at the, the coral reefs, the corals have color. So if you're going to hide among the corals and the corals are brightly colored, then you can be brightly colored. All right. Here in local, you know, uh, aquatic environments, we don't have brightly colored coral. So, you know, bright colors stand out more. Secondly, like why would you be blue or green? Doesn't that make you bright and obvious? Not in deep water, it doesn't. Because the red and the yellow wavelengths of light are lost in the upper layer. By the time you get down to the bottom, it's all blue and green light. So blue and green let you actually camouflage. All right. And so um, there's that, obviously there's other forms of camouflage. If you're white on your belly and dark on your back, a predator looking down doesn't see you because it's dark below. A predator looking up doesn't see you because it's looking towards the light. So that's another you know, aspect of, uh, of uh, coloration. All right. Somewhere, and once again, this is the quick abbreviated version. All right, we'll just go here. Um, obviously, sometimes you, you want to attract members of your group. And unlike our ponds and lakes, where, you know, you've got a couple kinds of sunfish, a couple kinds of bass, a couple kinds of trout. You know, these reefs have the greatest diversity of, of sea life anywhere. So how do you find your group? How do you find members of you know, your species for mating? That's a bigger problem for these fish than it is for um, uh, for most. So now bright colors, if it helps you in a big open ocean, figure out, you know, who's, you know, in my group that I can associate that, you know, you have a problem more profoundly than, you know, the bass and sunfish do in our area. But once again, here's, here's the kicker though. Um, how do fish see color differently than us? Actually have more genes for the eye proteins um, there. So they, some of them see UV light. All right, so they see different ones. So trying to hide from a predator, not hiding from a human predator, you're hiding from a fish predator. So how do fish see light? That's then the question. If you, you're calm specific to see you, how do they see light? So I know when I look at this, like, wow, they're so brightly colored. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter how I see them. It matters how they see them. And the fact that sharks aren't bony fish and others are, like, now you've got fish which aren't related to each other. So they have different ways of perceiving color. So it's a complicated question. A lot of the, the reasons that you see stripes and bars, et cetera, is that you're trying to hide from a predator. What you really want is you want to break up. So here's just green. Notice how much green there is around here. In the, uh, the, um, you might see black bars, which break up an outline. If a predator is looking for something that looks like fish, if you've got all these bars or these spots on you, like the predator might not see a fish, it might see the bar. So that's a reason for those colors. Okay. So some stuff with fish. All right. Let's jump uh, into birds for a little bit. Um, now there's all of these carotenoids. All right. They can be in algae. And if it can be an algae, they can be in like invertebrates, brine shrimp and some fly larvae that eat the algae. And then there are birds that eat a lot of brine shrimp. And so once again, there are birds that just eat a lot of little invertebrates that have pink color. And rather than excrete it, they decide to put it in their feathers. And so this can make them pink or even red in the case of the scarlet ibis, which you'll see. So once again, they're not making pigment, they're eating it and then transferring it from their digestive system uh, into uh, 
into their feathers, uh, the scarlet ibis looking a little redder. And, you know, they can identify members of their own species. Uh, but then also spoonbills do this. Uh, but then also females look at males and once again get an idea of uh, how um, brightly, uh, how well uh, fed they are. So once again, if we were to say, why are feathers different colors? First thing is melanin. A lot of melanin makes black. You know, you make a little less melanin or a slightly different version of melanin it can look like a reddish or it can look brown. So there's a whole lot of that. There's actually a different way of making brown called porphyrin. And owls do that. So owls are brown for a different reason. Um, the way when we break down red blood cells, we make heme to bilirubin, but owl make it uh, into porphyrin and that makes them brown. So brown and owl uh, has another aspect to it rather than most, which uh, uh, is melanin. Melanin can also then produce uh, grays. Yellows and reds, once again, that's what they eat. That's the carotenoid. All right, so if you're going to eat plants, all right, you're going to get plant pig. Remember, the leaves are, you know, the leaves are yellow, the leaves are orange, the berries are red. So there's carotenoids in the plants. And if you take it from your digestive system and put it in your others, now you're red or you're yellow uh, or whatever. I'll talk about the patterns in just a second. Once again, there are no blue pigments, all right? But if you structure your feathers such a way, when it hits, when light hits it, but just the structure of the feather, not a pig molecule, just the feather structure itself is going to have blue light bounce back uh, towards uh, your eyes. So this is what blue, this is violet. Uh, it's like shiny greens, it's iridescent colors, just like in fish scales. It's how the structure of the feather or the fish uh, scale um, uh, uh, works. Okay. Now, um, once again, we get into a reason, uh, a, you know, a question of why. Uh, this, I, um, I, we're, we're winding down like the nature part. We get into the human variation part, just if you're thinking of time. But this next point is so important. I'd like to just take a little aside, if you will. Okay. So um, I'd like to ask the group a question. And if anyone wants to shout out or put in the chat, yes, you know, we'll just have fun with this. All right. So here are two slides. If you were these guys, should they have sex? Yes or no? I'll give you two guesses. It doesn't matter. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, good. Okay. So, yes. The reason I would say yes mm -hmm. is look how similar they are genetically. Look, chromosomes all match up. Like their chromosomes are the red part there, there's the blue part. They all match. I say yes. Should these flies have sex? Well, if the answer before was yes, this should be no. All right, right. Yeah, I'm going to say no. All right, and there's a lot more of these as you can guess. So I'm just going to keep. And here's the reason: as populations are separated, they can vary over time. And some of the variations are genetic variations, get bigger and bigger and bigger, and get to the point where if these two flies were to meet, then odds are their offspring wouldn't do very well. So see here, they have the same genes. They all have like a, or parts of the chromosome. They're red, they have a blue, they have green, they have a yellow. But the order is different. Humans can have this, where you have what's called chromosomal inversion. And if you, you know, between you and your partner, if one of them has a chromosomal inversion, you might find out because you might go to your doctor and you say, we've 10 miscarriages. We're, we're just having a lot of trouble conceiving why. And you look under the microscope, they do a study and they say, ooh, one of you has a chromosomal inversion. Genetic differences beyond a specific point then very often can uh, cause, you know, the uh, two individual, the sperm won't fuse with the ovary, or they don't even start to divide as an embryo, or the embryo will fail before birth, or the, uh, the, the young will be uh, um, healthy and often die shortly after birth, or they might be sterile. So when we think of, you know, horses and uh, donkeys mate and the mules are uh, in, infertile. Um, and so that's happening with all of these populations as flies vary, at a certain point, two different flies, they're just too different. They probably shouldn't mate. If they do, they're wasting their reproductive energies. Because it costs a lot for a female to make eggs. It costs a lot for a male to like defend a territory and ward off other males. This is energy invested in passing on your genes. If you then mate with an individual who is so different from you genetically that your offspring aren't healthy, you've wasted that energy. So all of these individuals, it is in their interest to say, who is related to me 
and likely have healthy offspring versus who isn't. So uh, we, you know, so they're doing this. So let's just apply this to nature. All right. So let's apply this. This will be a little bit of a quiz for you. I'm a teacher, so yes, you're being this. So here are these birds. All right. Here, here's a little cheat sheet, first of all, but I, I'm sure a lot of you don't need this. I'll kill the volume. All right. So if you've ever been at like an Audubon party or a Moffat Library party or whatever, and at this party, you notice, oh, nah, you find it interesting, maybe attractive, and you're thinking, I might ask for the number or whatever. Did you ever say, wait, let me stop? Is this a member of my species? Anyone? Let's go with no. Let's go with no. Um, and the reason is, well, in the past, there were different species of human. There aren't now. So if someone looks human, eh, are. And then so you don't have to worry about this. But think about these ducks. Come spring, there could be a dozen different species on the pond. Who do they have sex with? Because if they choose wrongly, they wasted their energy. The eggs won't hatch. Those young won't live. They won't pass down their genes. And so there's a quiz for you. Who should this female accept as a mate? Male number one, male number two, male number three. What do we say? I'll give you three guesses. Number one. All right, number one. Yeah. No, good, good, great. Good guess. Anyone else? <laughs> three. Okay. Three. So this is the male mallard. This is the female mallard. She can tell he's her male because of his colored, you know, um, uh, feathers here on the head. Whereas this female wood duck, would she pick? Male one or two? Number one. Give you two guesses. All right. She would pick number one. That's her male. This female ring neck duck would pick this one. They're using color to distinguish between which partners they raise healthy, you know, uh, offspring with, which is which ones they could not. All right. And if we were to just look out, you know, there were just so many examples of this. Hopefully it'll go. You know, but all of these ducks, there are a dozen species, but the females, all right, so here's a female buffhead. Who will she mate with, male one, two, or three? Three guesses. Three. Oh, three, yeah. She's, ah, that's my male. I recognize his color. Um, female, a pintail duck, will she mate with, one or two? One. All right. Ooh. Two. No, sorry. All right. Oh, no. don't, don't do this the wrong way. You wouldn't make a very good female pintail duck. Just saying. All right. So this is the male pintail duck, and then here is the um, uh, the uh, hooded uh, uh, ganser male. So the females are using color to distinguish among the dozen species who are at the pond who is mine, who is in my group. The males, who should I court? The females, who should I mate with? Become migration time. Who should I form a group with? Is that just well? And I'm sorry. Before, yeah. So just here, real quick. Yeah, I'm sorry. We'll go here. This is uh, one of the songs you can't hear. I'm a warbler song. So you're not going to get the benefit of the sound. I don't think. All right. Um, but look at this warbler. It has a unique coloration. Look at that one. That has another one. Look at that one. That one, that one, that one, and there's that one, and there's that one, and there's that one. All of these different colors. Why? Because we've got all these little birds in the woods. Who do they have sex with? All right. If they choose wrongly, they're wasting their energy. But they're using color to identify. Oh, you're in my group. Now, once again, I want to be careful. Birds don't see color the way that I do. All right. So, I mean, I think it's obvious, but birds might be, you know, getting a different picture from that. So I just, you know, have to. Except like there might be a little more to the picture uh, and I um, and then I see. Right. So birds do that. The fish are doing that. The bugs are doing that. I mean, I'm sure you get the idea. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll go on. Sorry. But look at these dragonflies. And then you look at these. Oh, these are damselflies. All right. Oh, come on. I've got, sorry. I got a whole bunch of them. Yeah, we'll go here. So. There was a damselfly that was black and had, or it was green and had black wings. Then here's a damselfly. Oh, you know, nice blue colors there. 
Here's a dragonfly with a green. So why are there so many colors in nature? Because this is hard for us to understand because we don't confuse species. There's only one human of species alive today. But that's not, there's a lot of damn flies. There's a lot of little frogs. There's a lot of brown sparrows. Who's in your group? Well, color can now make your reproduction worthwhile because if you hadn't used color to correctly identify a potential mate, you could have wasted all of that you know, energy and not passed on your genes. So that is a very important aspect uh, to color um, in, uh, in nature. I just had something on dinosaurs. Dinosaurs evolved feathers before they could fly. So why why did they? Well, I'm sorry. But I'll show it to you. Why why would you have feathers if you can't fly? Why? Did these dinosaurs get feathers? Well, maybe it was to keep warm. Maybe it was for camouflage. Maybe it was for courtship. Maybe that one of the original things for feathers was to sort out who's in my group versus not my group before um, actual flight evolved. All right. Now, snake scales, and I'm sorry, I'm going to, it's dark where I am. I don't know if you can see this. Ooh, come on. I'm reaching in the dark. Okay. I don't know if you can see this. This is a snake skin. I notice it has no color. But that's because when snakes shed skin, you get the epidermis. All of the color is in the deeper layer called the dermis. All right. And so um, snakes also uh, have uh, carotenoids that they can put in, they can make melanin. And so we can get a variety of colors in snakes. And snake scales can look iridescent. Kind of see how the blue and kind of shiny. Once again, just like. Feather structure and fish scale structure can give us blues and shiny greens, et cetera. Notice the iridescent color on the boa, the, uh, the structure of the, uh, the snake scale can do the same. Two other I thing on uh, uh, a color is, oh, I'm sorry, that's the next one. I was, so let's talk about you first. There's what's called fluorescence. Fluorescence is when you absorb one color and later you emit other one. So you kind of convert energy into a different kind of energy. Um, and so here are corals, all right? And so you, know, you can shine white light on them. But then when you put black light on them, you're now getting the colors that they give off. That's what's called fluorescence. And one of the reasons that corals do that is because the algae, which will do photosynthesis inside their cells, they want to attack them. So they're actually saying, hey, algae, I'll give you a home, you know, for you to live in if you would come and produce sugar for me. And so um, uh, in, as we look at the colors in the world, there are fluorescent colors, which you might not see under white light, you know, but under a black light, you know, these corals look very, very different. Okay. Um, but then uh, you can also then have what's called bioluminescence. Bioluminescence is different than fluorescence. Fluorescence is I get light and I emit version of that light out. Bioluminescence is just make my own light from nothing. So I could be pitch black and I would still be emitting light that's bioluminescence uh, uh, here. And this is a comb jelly, a uh, relative of jellyfish uh, that, um, that does that. And my genetics class, uh, we take the jellyfish gene, which is, um, uh, that gives it that fluorescent uh, uh, green pigment, and then we put it into bacteria. So we've made bacteria kind of glow uh, green uh, because of that, um, that pigment. Okay, uh, there are other reasons for, um, uh, for color. Uh, color could be when you say, hey, predators, notice me, learn this color, don't eat it, all right? So um, milkweed is toxic, or right? milkweed just has all of these really dangerous uh, chemicals which can affect animals, heart, etc. So milk has toxic um, molecules in it. Some bugs have figured out how to eat milkweed and A, not die, but B, take the milkweed poisons and toxins and now put it in their body. So now the bugs are toxic. So these bugs are now brightly colored, warning all the other uh, predators. Birds, you, you want to remember this red, color. see how obvious this is? Don't eat this, you'll get sick. So the bird will maybe try its first one and hate the taste of it. I mean, we do that too, bitter taste. Your tongue detects poison as bitter. So if it's bitter to you, 
your tongue saying, like if you eat something, like you just go outside in the wild and you pick a leaf and you put it in your mouth, like, oh, it's horrible. Your tongue is telling you you need that plant that's trying to kill you, right? That, that's what our bitter taste does. So birds would sample their first red bug and say, ooh, I'm never going to eat this red bug again, all right? And so now color is a warning coloration, all right? So this bug uh, is getting poisons uh, from milkweed, all right? And it's not the only one. There's other things that get, here's a beetle that gets poisons from milkweed. Look, it's also brightly colored because it wants predators to remember. Remember, I am poisonous, so avoid red from this point on. So the bright color makes it easier for the predator to learn. All right. Obviously, the brightly colored monarch butterfly, easy to spot, not camouflage. But the same thing, its larvae grow on milkweed, so it's toxic. So, hey, birds, learn not to bite uh, monarch um, butterflies. There's another uh, poisonous plant or plant that has a lot of toxins called dogbane. It has a name because dogs should need it. Dogs get sick if they do. Um, and so uh, they're brightly colored for the same thing, morning coloration. Red Fs are that way, all right? Um, uh, red Fs are warning, they have in their skin tetrodotoxin. They're warning all predators, don't eat the red. Learn from this. You, you put one in your mouth, you know how it tastes. Never uh, do that again. And it's easy to learn. So that's why they're so brightly colored. Now, I don't want to be insulting, um, but by this logic, fish are stupid. Because while the Easter newt is on land, it says, hey, predators, you're small enough to learn. So I'm going to be brightly colored, and you'll learn to avoid me. But once the adults go back to water, look what color they turn. Olive. They're, they're not showing off. They're not saying, hey, predators, notice me and learn. Fish are too stupid to learn. So they're saying, oh, we got to go back to camouflaging. Because fish won't learn from their mistakes. There's no advantage of being brightly colored. Here, the fish aren't going to like learn uh, to avoid uh, predation in the future. So the adult Easter newt looks like that, while the juvenile looks like that. Now, something else goes, if the predators learn to avoid, you know, red bugs or red salamanders, you can actually mimic that. So sometimes, all right, this is a type of coral stem from South America. It's poisonous, and it has like this red and black and yellow pattern. And you're going to see a couple of them. All of the first ones are poisonous coral snakes, so they're brightly colored, so that predators learn, I'm going to avoid bright colored um, uh, coral snakes here. But then we get into other ones, that's a different type of snake, and it's harmless. But there's an advantage in looking like the poisonous one that things have learned to avoid, so it's what's called a mimic. Monarchs are poisonous, but there's another butterfly that looks like them called the viceroy. It's poisonous. Once predators learn to avoid um, the monarch, some of that carries over uh, into protection for the red viceroy. Sometimes coloration just startles a predator. So look at uh, look at the um, spotted lanternfly. See that bright red? You don't see it normally because it's hidden and um, under normal condition, the spotted lantern fly uh, is camouflaged. Look, you don't see it very well. But when it spreads its wings, like when it's trying to fly, all of a sudden you see a bright red that might startle a predator and uh, deter it, right? And so you see a lot of that. Look, here's a moth. You don't see that red normally. You would only see it when it starts to fly away. It looks camouflaged first, but then if it were to take off, then, um, you know, then you would, uh, you would do that. So here in this four-eyed butterfly fish, it's got a spot that looks like an eye, right? So, you know, maybe all of a sudden a predator would say, ooh, is that an eye of a predator coming at me? Um, et cetera. So that's another reason car, uh, uh, colors and patterns. Now, like I said, um, uh, you know, I, I teach a lot of this and I have, you know, playlists and videos if anyone's interested. Uh, I'm just going to do super quick through uh, the last thing on color, uh, just in case anyone is uh, is interested. Um, melanin is the major pigment in humans. Once again, uh, we have these cells called melanocytes, which uh, inject little things of melanin into epidermal cells, which then absorb ultraviolet light. All right. And as humans, one of the things that makes us vary is that we vary in how um, much melanin we make. Everyone has melanocytes, whether you have the darkest possible skin or the lightest possible skin, you make the same amount of melanocytes. But how active those melanocytes are 
skin uh, there. So here you can see on the left are images uh, from an individual who had very dark skin, and here images on uh, the right, very light skin. So notice that just the amount of melanin, which is being injected into skin cells, uh, varies. All right. Um, and if you were to ask, all right, then what determines that? I'm just curious. Uh, well, you know, we have uh, genes which then affect uh, melanin, which is produced in skin, in hair, and in our iris. Interestingly, there's actually two different kinds of melanin. There's a brown to black kind, there's a reddish kind. So if you know someone who has like red hair and very fair skin, they have a genetic mutation. They can't make the brown to black kind, but they can make the red kind. But because they, they can't make the brown to, to black kind, they know they have to stay out of the sun. They have, you know, very fair skin. Uh, they have red hair, and they they don't tame. They go from pale to burn, and they're at a high risk of skin cancer. And uh, this is beyond us right now. But there are genes which vary in us, and so depending on which version of this gene that you have, um, would then uh, determine uh, uh, how much melanin uh, you make. So there are genes which control skin color, there are genes which can control hair and iris color, and I'll give them here in some of the variations, you know, and feel free to go here. And that's not just us. So if you look at what makes Labrador's uh, different um, than others, uh, there are genes, but interestingly, it starts to get complicated very often. Because while there's one gene which determines whether you're dark or light, let, that's the B gene, all right? The second gene in E, determines are you dark or light brown or are you dark or light yellow? So to know the pigment, you just can't know one gene, you have to study two. So it's it's a little more complicated. Fruit fly eyes are cut, you know, what was causing the, you know, the difference in these fruit fly eye colors. It turns out it's not just one gene, it's it's multiple genes. So it can be a little complicated. Um, when we look at eye color, let's imagine that all of these individuals have the same gene for brown eyes. So they all have genes for brown eyes, all right? But let me just jump to the end. This individual makes more brown, so their eyes look almost black. This one makes the brown, but brown to this person is different from the brown for the other person, so their eye has a slightly different hue. This one, uh, instead of making brown all throughout the iris, makes brown in spots. This one is brown in a ring that's like a, a lot near the pupil and then less as it goes out. And this person has one gene that says make brown pigment and another gene that says don't listen to gene number one, stop. I'll turn off number one. So just human eye color, you can't predict eye color just knowing one gene. There's all of these genes which interact. We'll go back to the fish or the birds, all right? So color can be so varied in, um, in a population. I'm just gonna run away so I can turn on the lights here. Okay. So then I just have some here in Siamese cats. It's even now uh, what determines a Siamese cat is temperature, it's environment. So Siamese cats are born white and the cold pots, parts of the body make pigment and the cool parts don't. So not only are there a lot of genes, but a lot of, envi uh, a lot of environmental factors uh, involved. All right. Um, and the, uh, the last thing I think I would like to do is I'm going to do something that works in theory. And Dave, you can help me. I don't know if I can pin myself just for a second and just hold these up to the camera. I so I'm just going to show way. just some of the the, the beauty in, in bird feathers. If you wanted to get a close look, obviously here's you know a uh, scarlet tanager. Not all of these are native to our area, and I apologize. I just grabbed them out of the drawer, and I don't necessarily know everybody's name, especially if they're not local. Um, here you can see that warbler yellow throat. You know, these are such small birds. But, you know, as you look, they have such distinct, you know, coloration patterns so that, you know, you can tell who belongs in your group versus not. Um, while all of the red-bellied woodpeckers, oh, and if you ever wondered why is a red-bellied woodpecker called a red-bellied woodpecker, it does have a little red on the belly. Obviously, that's not the red that you notice. Um, but this would be a male. A female has red on her head, but just not as much. Um, once again, the green and uh, blue uh, pigments are not actually a, a pigment, but rather just how then the feathers are reflecting the light. So it would be the structure of the feather, uh, which is uh, doing that and giving us some of the iridescent ones. So this could have a role in, uh, you know, in courtship and identifying your uh, species, but also with parrots, obviously it's camouflage. I don't know if anyone has ever been in a tree filled with parrots. You know there's parrots in there because you can hear them. Parrots are really loud. You can't see them. I mean, I've got my binoculars, my bird guide. I'm under a tree. 
looking for the um, uh, looking for the pirates, trying to identify the one that I saw. I can't see any of them because they're they blend in uh, so uh, well. Uh, uh, variations in populations build up. So flickers are one species, but notice that there's two different populations of them, a red shafted flicker and a yellow shafted flicker. You know, maybe we come back some point in the future and there's two different species of, uh, uh, of a flicker. Notice that lots of these birds have black on their wings, right? So is that protected? Is that to um, affect how well they fly? So that uh, the tips of their wings get uh, warmer and that affects how air uh, goes uh, over them. Um, so, you know, just questions and obviously here's, if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer as many as, uh, as I 